Well, welcome to Historical Journeys with Dale Blanchard. Today, we're going to take a trip to Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone is one of the most wonderful spots in God's creation, if you ask me. You can imagine what the early explorers thought when they came upon it with all the wonderful things it has there. We're going to take a closer look at it today and, uh, and see what we can find in this beautiful place. There's a, um, there's a picture by Albert Beerstat, Beardstat. He was one of those uh, Hudson River School of Art painters who went west after the Civil War and painted some of those grand scenes. This one happens to be Old Faithful Geyser in Yellowstone National Park. Beautiful picture. Yellowstone, um, here we go. I call this program Yellowstone Then and Now because I love those old pictures from 100 years ago. But I have a I have a set of books in my library that are by John L. Stoddard. And John L. Stoddard was a he, he uh, was a travelogue presenter. He would go and take pictures and come back and and show them on the magic lanterns. And it was, but I, but on one of them, you see there it says in the center, California Grand Canyon and Yellowstone Park. He visited Yellowstone Park back in the 1890s. There he is, a dapper gentleman with that fine mustache there. Um, and he wrote an account. It's interesting to look at him from a, from a writer's standpoint, he just struggled to be able to adequately describe what he saw there in Yellowstone National Park. Of course, he saw um, the fort, Fort Yellowstone. He saw the uh, his geysers like with the formations like this. He saw this is called the Devil's Punch Bowl over year over the years that the sediment as it was expanding out of there built up a rim around it. So you have something like that. You call it the Devil's Punch Bowl, I guess. Um, but this is the one that really caught my attention. And I said, if I ever go there, I bet I can find that rock. I don't think anybody's picked that up and moved it. It's about twice as tall as I am. And who knows how much it weighs. And sure enough, when our family took a trip there, I found that rock. There it was, still sitting there after a century after John Stoddard took the picture, just like it has been since creation almost. Our family took the trip in 1996. Um, boy, that's 24 years ago already. We started a Memorial Day weekend, which was warm in Minnesota, but there was still snow as we got up there in, in Wyoming and kept climbing up in the air. And most of Yellowstone National Park is above 7,500 feet. So we, we had snow on the ground the first night. As we got closer, we began to see many of the features that are there in Yellowstone National Park. There you can see some antelopes in the background there. And we saw the water beginning to rush. Water is a huge part of Yellowstone National Park. Thoroughly enjoyed that aspect of it. Here it is. Yellowstone National Park was our first national park. Back in 1972, Congress set it aside as a national park. And it's big. I mean, what's, what is that? Something like uh, over 40 miles in each direction. Anyway, there's the characteristic uh, figure eight road plan in there with Mammoth Hot Springs and Old Faithful Geyser and, and uh, Tower Junction near Tower Falls. All these are, are places that have become familiar to vacation goers. We were going into the Silver Gate up in the northeast but because of the snow, the mountain passes were closed. We had to go over the Gardner Gate and come down into Mammoth Hot Springs, which was just fine. Yellowstone, of course, has a history of occupation by indigenous peoples from 10,000 years ago. The first white Europeans were there. Lewis and Clark did not uh, explore Yellowstone National Park. They were north of that, but as they were coming back home, one of their members split off the group, John Coulter, and he did explore Yellowstone National Park. And so the, uh, they were able, Lewis and Clark were able, when they put out their map some years later, they were able to incorporate some of John Coulter's findings in that. But it was the old, uh, the old trappers in the 1830s and 1840s that began to bring back stories to civilization. Jim Bridger was one. Jim Bridger wasn't one to uh, 
to, uh, you know, to let a good story go to waste. He came back and he started telling people of this wonderful place, he said, where he, where he saw a whole mountain of glass and he saw petrified trees and he saw a place where he saw a man pull a trout out of the, out of the lake and dip it in this hole and it, and it uh, boiled it right there and he could eat it for his supper. Well, you know, people discounted what Jim Berger said. He was always telling stories, but, and he, you know, when people didn't believe him, he, he just embellished them a little bit more. He talked about the petrified birds singing their petrified songs in those petrified trees. But people found out that Jim Bridger wasn't entirely making up this story. The cliff on the right is Obsidian Cliff, and it is made of volcanic glass. When you heat up sand uh, to a high enough temperature, it turns to glass. Not the kind of glass that you can see through, but the kind of glass when you break it has sharp edges. They found Yellowstone glass as far east as Ohio. It was a Hopewell people, they were saying, had traded evidently and used and got broken glass for scrapers and arrowheads and things like that. Um, there's a petrified tree that he was talking about where, you know, the sediment built up around a tree and over time the tree was replaced, uh, the cells of the tree were replaced by minerals and then the, then the debris around the tree washed away again and there it stood, still standing there today. And there was a spot up on Lake Yellowstone where one of those hot spots was and John Stoddard said he watched this man catch a trout, dip it in that hole, and boil it, just like Jim Bridger had said about 60 years earlier. Well, Congress heard so many things that finally they sent a group out there to explore and find out exactly what it was. Nathaniel Langford was one of the leaders of the expedition. He was a Minnesotan. And they went out there and they spent weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks exploring, making notes, taking measurements, um, and uh, they came back with a whole lot of information. This is a map that was sketched by Nathaniel Langford. And of course, you know, he didn't get up in the air. We have satellite views today to, to see. And I, and I went and found one of those satellite views just to see how accurate Nathaniel Langford was. He was pretty accurate, if you ask me. Some of the water has gone away in some of those spots. But there's a good picture of Yellowstone Lake, and you can see how mountainous the terrain is. Around Yellowstone Lake and extending out in different directions is a caldera, top of an ancient volcano, which brings uh, Yellowstone to where it is today. Well, the uh, Congress set it aside as our first national park. They did it for reasons that we'll discuss later. They appointed a superintendent, forgot to give him any budget for five years, finally sent the army out there. The army uh, men were the first park rangers. Good thing they were there. They, uh, the fort, the buildings that they built eventually are still there today. You can look down from the peaks around Mammoth Hot Springs and there you can see some of those buildings have been standing there for over a hundred years. It was in 1877 that Chief Joseph and his Nez Perce Indians, who didn't want to get onto the reservation where they were being told to go, took off with his 200 warriors and, and uh, I don't know, maybe 600 people altogether. And he escaped the armies for quite a while, came right across Yellowstone National Park. There were about 35 tourists there. So you can see it was developing slowly. And the Nez Perce killed some of them, wounded some of the others. They were eventually stopped before they got to Canada and forced upon the reservation. And Chief Joseph gave his famous speech saying, I will fight no more forever. Well, of course, the geysers are the big draw, one of the big draws, maybe the biggest one, to Yellowstone National Park. Geysers are places where the water is down under the earth and the crust is evidently thin enough that it gets very, very hot. And some mechanism releases the water when it gets under a certain pressure and it blows. As you can see in the distance, there are several basins in which these geysers occur. This is the Norris Basin up towards Mammoth Hot Springs. We watched in this place here where the, the steam started to flow out of the center hole there and then it got bigger and then it came out in a big geyser. And all over the park, you find things like this. About half of the geysers in the world 
There are some in Iceland, some in other places, but about half of the ones in the world are found in the small space of Yellowstone National Park. And uh, you find other things as well. These are paint pots with the beautiful colorations there. There are springs like this. Some of them are very, very hot and very, very dangerous. People and animals have lost their lives in these things. Here's one of my favorites, mud pots. Mud pots are places where the gas is escaping, the steam is escaping from below, and it burbles up through that. Bloop, 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 bloop. It's just the funniest thing to watch, and it has worked that, that dirt or clay there over so much that it's very fine, just like um, maybe a sheetrocker's mud would be. I thought they were hilarious, though. There's a lake up there, Yellowstone Lake, about 7,500 feet up in the air. And you wonder how the water gets there, but there's plenty of runoff from, from uh, the mountains around there. This is one of John L. Stoddard's pictures. If you stand at a certain place, you can see the sleeping giant. There in the middle, just to the right of center, you can see his head and his nose, his mouth, and then to the left is his chest. I imagine you can see that still today. One of the big features of Yellowstone National Park is the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. Not as grand as the one in Arizona, but still very beautiful and very, very grand. Um, this is a picture from above. Over on the left, you can see the upper falls, and over on the right, you can see the lower falls. There's a little one in the middle, too. But those falls have to be some of the most photographed things that you ever saw. Here's John Stoddard's picture. doesn't do it justice with the printing. This picture amazes me. This is a picture taken by William Jackson on that expedition with Langford. A beautiful picture, very high resolution. Of course, today we have color pictures, but back then you have to appreciate they weren't carrying around a little camera in their pocket. You can see this picture here. He lugged that old camera. Thing stands about four or five feet tall, and I don't know how much it weighs, but they lugged that up there to that point to take some of those beautiful pictures. And they had to develop them right on the spot, too. Um, and so uh, uh, you can see that uh, there's a reason to appreciate those pictures that William Jackson took there. Um, here's a modern picture of the falls of that characteristic shape. This is the lower falls of the Yellowstone River and where the Grand Canyon effectively begins. Um, this is a picture of, uh, from, there are several points. There's an inspiration point, an artist point. I think this is artist point. And how many pictures, they have a boardwalk coming down to this spot. And uh, people come down there and take pictures. You can see John Stoddard's photographer took one from the exact same spot there. One of these, I forget whether it's Artist Point or Inspiration Point, in 1975 or so, the earthquake dropped about 100 feet of the walkway into the canyon. The good thing there wasn't anybody on it at the time, so they've had to shorten that up, and you can't get quite as good a view as you used to. As the Yellowstone River heads north out of the park, it goes by Tower Creek, and just before Tower Creek hits the Yellowstone River, it goes over Tower Falls. This is one of the most impressive places. You have to start up on the top and then you go down a set of stairs that are about 500 feet in height and you get down into this place and, and uh, it's not called Tower Falls because it towers over you, although it certainly does. It's Tower Creek. Actually, it's Tower Fall, I guess, not Falls. Anyway, it's cool down there, naturally air conditioned. The noise, the falls are thundering. It's just a very beautiful spot down there. If you're hardy enough to get down, of course, when you get down, you got to climb back out again, too. This is uh, the Grand Canyon gives you an opportunity to see how the land is formed around there. You see those two layers of basalt, one near the bottom of the cliff and one near the top, with the characteristic pillars there. That is from uh, lava flow that curls cools in a certain way. So you can see that Yellowstone has been, uh, there have been several grand eruptions that have covered all the whole territory with lava and helped form the park. Then the river cut through and exposed that. I talked about water. Water is one of the major features of the park and it is the source of the Yellowstone River. There's this little pond up there way up on the top on the Continental Divide. Continental Divides are those ridges that divide the water from one river into another. And this one happens to be 
there's that pool there when it rains, and there can be two drops of water side by side. If one drop of water goes to the left, it'll end up in the Atlantic Ocean, and the other dropper, other drop of water says goodbye and goes to the right, it'll end up in the Pacific Ocean. But the water flows down from there. We climbed this little hill there and saw the snow melting and it was running down that hillside in rivulets. When it got there, it joined a little stream. The little stream ran into a bigger one. And the bigger one, you know, the river drops quite a bit. It's not a placid river in the park. It's a roaring river and uh, rushing around and then finally comes over the falls down into the Grand Canyon where it is cut down into that, that rock and just a beautiful, beautiful uh, river in that spot there. Finally, it comes out onto the plains and, uh, and is a placid river again. Very, very beautiful. And joined, the Yellowstone joins the Missouri. I think it's the major source of the Missouri. The Yellowstone is over 600 miles long, so it's not a small river. It's a beautiful one, especially in the park. Now here's one of the major features of the park. Do you recognize that hole in the ground there? It, uh, that happens to be one of the most famous holes in the ground ever. That is Old Faithful Geyser. Through that opening comes Old Faithful. And uh, this is a picture of William Jackson took in 1872 uh, when the tourists could come right up to it. Old Faithful is so named because about every hour used to be just on a dot per near till there was an earthquake back in the 1960s or somewhere in there and it rearranged it a little bit but it still goes off every hour or so a little bit less punctually and so that's why they call it old faithful if you don't have much time you can drive in and see old faithful erupt and get back out of there here's a picture of a old faithful erupting there nowadays you can't walk up there they keep you far away so you don't get burned and all of that I still like this picture of Alfred Bierstadt's. This is a, the uh, you know, phot photographs are wonderful, especially when they have high resolution. There's something to be said for an artist's depiction of it too. Isn't that a, a beautiful picture by Albert Bierstadt? This is giant geyser. There are hundreds of geysers, and some of them are tiny, and some of them are middle-sized, and some of them are big. This is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, giant geyser while it's uh, not quite erupting there. I found these pictures. The one on the left is is a picture from, uh, I think that's Stoddard's picture. The one on the right is one of those colorized photos from later. I did not get a picture because one of my daughters and I, we decided we would stay there. There's a window. The geysers go off within a certain window. Old Faithful goes off within a five or ten minute window. But Giant Geyser only goes off, at least the time we were there, about once every four days. And there's a four-hour window, sometime between 6 o'clock and 10 o'clock on the day we were there. So the other, our family, the other families with us went back to the camp. My daughter Betsy and I stayed there. It was a beautiful thing. Um, while we were there, it got dark. And you know, as it gets dark outside, the color begins to drain out of the sky. And you get these amber tones. And then the last ones that go are the whites. Well, as we were there... We got a taste of what it must be like for some of the first persons that came into that area there, that geyser basin, because all we could see when it was almost completely dark were these ghostly geysers that would shoot up here and shoot up there. It was just amazing. The people, early people must have thought there were ghosts walking. Anyway, if you want to learn about geysers, the experts will tell you, well, just go there and you'll find some people sitting there and they won't be paying the least bit of attention. They'll be reading or doing a crossword puzzle. They're geyser gazers. They're people that just for one reason or another are experts and they like that particular geyser. So ask them a question. They'll be happy to tell you. And sure enough, we found a small group of people who were sitting there watching and they gave us all sorts of stories about the geyser. And what they said was, they said, you watch, there'll be an initial eruption that won't be near as big. But uh, if it's a bigger eruption, the initial one, oh, the people will groan and be disappointed. But if it's only a small one, a short one, the people will cheer because that means a bigger eruption when the, when the main one comes. And sure enough, as we were watching, finally, it was about 15 minutes after the 10-minute window, the, the four-hour window, finally here came this little bit of a geyser you know a little bit of a blow and it was very short and sure enough people cheered but then when the geyser went up it just went way up in the air and the mist enveloped us it was just a beautiful sight it truly was a great 
great thing to wait for. But we were lucky because I found this sign um, from the National Park Service that said there were five years or so in there where the geyser didn't go off at all. So I guess it's uh, pretty intermittent now for one reason or another. This is one of the pictures I thought, surely, John L. Stoddard, I should be able, if that's what it looked like then, I should be able to find out what it looks like now. And sure enough, that, uh, that geyser is still there today. It looks like, for all the world, like an E.T. coming up out of the ground, doesn't it? Very distinctive formation. This is one I thought for sure I could find. Sure enough, I did in the lower picture. This is called Liberty Cap. When the colonists were thinking about becoming independent from Great Britain, they would raise a shapeless cap upon a pole, and that was showed where the meeting was supposed to be of the rebels, the patriots. And so that became one of the early symbols of our country. What this is, is a, it's, a, it's a plug. When some uh, geyser, a fumarole or something, you know, hardened up, it, uh, and then the ground washed away around it, it left that plug still standing there today. This is the morning glory pool. John Stoddard... I had to be sympathetic to poor John because, of course, he only had black and white photography. And he tried desperately to tell how beautiful the morning glory pool was. And the picture, even the picture that I took there on the right, doesn't do justice to it. The most beautiful colors are found in nature. And the, the blending of one color into another color and the deepening of the blues that went down towards the hole. Um, it was just a beautiful, beautiful pool. And there are a lot of those kind of things. John Stoddard talking about, talked about going by one place. I don't know if you'd call it a fumarole or what, but where the steam was coming out of the ground and it made this unearthly growl, he said. I said, I bet that's still there, the black growler. And sure enough, it was. It wasn't quite as unearthly as John Stoddard described it. And there was Jim Bridger's petrified tree. John Stoddard's picture, of course, you could walk right up to it and chip a piece off, which is, you know, American tourists, they want to take something home with them. And that's what they were doing. They were chipping off pieces. I was, oh, it's a big thing and nobody will ever miss it. But by the time 18,000 tourists go by, the thing would disappear. So naturally now they put a fence around it and made it a strict law. No chipping off pieces. How about Jim Bridger's Obsidian Cliff up there on the top? There it is today. Um, with all the debris around there, you can still... You can still find pieces of glass just like the Indians did if you want to get a buffalo hide scraper or something for your bow and arrow. Minerva Terrace is one where, where the water is running down over a series of terraces and the, it has built up those um, little pulpits, as they call them in, in, in the pulpit terrace. Every drop of water has a tiny bit of mineral in it and when the water would go over a lip, slow down perhaps, that little, those little drops of sediment would drop out, and over the eons, they build up, build up these terraces. Um, here's that, isn't that beautiful? There, they're big, uh, big things like that where the water is flowing down over, over the terraces. Animals are another great thing. You know, this is a big, huge park, and no fences. It's one of the great places in the world where the animals can roam, the buffalo can roam all day, even though the skies might actually be cloudy. Here's John L. Stoddard's picture, a little help from the photographer touching it up. The buffalo were magnificent in the park. They stay there all year. They don't migrate to the south. They're pretty tough. I found this picture taken by a lady named Carol Highsmith, who took about 100,000 pictures and gave them to the Library of Congress, so they're there for anybody with those magnificent buffalo walking through there. But, uh, you know, talk about a home where the buffalo roam. They are the kings of the park. They're not afraid of anything. Even grizzly bears are not afraid of unless they're old and weak. Just uh, look at all those buffalo there. We found, uh, this is another Carol Highsmith picture, look at how much meat there is on the hoof there. Those uh, those giants, of course, are just... I talked to a man one time that raised buffalo on his farm. He said, people are so afraid of buffalo. He said, but you can make a buffalo go about anywhere he wants to go, he said. <laughs> I guess that's about true. It was certainly true here. You know, we got by these. They got off the road for us. There's that buffalo calf there. But 
Here's, here's a picture of buffalo in the winter. The buffalo have the right of way. I mean, I think they would take it even if they didn't formally have it. If you get behind the buffalo and they're going the same direction as you, you're just going to have to wait. Take your sweet time just like they are taking their sweet time because they are the bosses of creation there. Um, when uh, my friend and I, we had our families up there camping, we went with the young boys back on this boardwalk and looked at some of those paint pots and mud, mud holes back in there bubbling. We came back and told the ladies about it. And they said, well, it'll take us about half an hour. We'll go over and see it. So they walked into this. We were waiting for our supper, and they didn't come back. They didn't come back. Finally, after about two hours, they came back. We said, what's the deal? Making us wait for our supper. And they said, well, a bunch of buffalo camped on that boardwalk, and they couldn't get around them. They just had to wait until the buffalo were ready, good and ready to get off that boardwalk. There are elk in the park, too, magnificent ones like this, but... We found them, I found them on the on the yard there in in the, the uh, Mammoth Hot Springs, um, by the fort there in these old buildings. I imagine this was dessert. Those tender, those tender shoots of green grass there just come out in the spring. They uh, they warned you stay away from these. They talked about a lady got too near a buffalo two weeks ago and he crushed her against the fence. They made sure to to tell you about those things. There are bears in Yellowstone National Park and grizzly bears, the king of the bears. Um, and uh, here's a picture Carol Highsmith took of a grizzly bear out there. We got to see some grizzly bears. One of those experts that prepared you for vacation said, if you want to see a bear, you know, they, they have moved the bears away. We'll see some pictures of people feeding bears, but they don't allow that anymore. People have gotten killed by bears. And uh, and uh, so they've moved them away, and they cover up all the garbage in, you know, where the bears used to have their feasts every night and and forbid tourists to, to feed them. But if you want to see one, when these one of these guides said, just drive along the road there, and you'll see somebody stop there with a telescope or binoculars or a spotting scope and ask them, and they'll be looking at a bear. <laughs> And they'll be happy to let you see. And sure enough, we found a couple from Texas. They were camping out in Yellowstone National Park for the entire summer. People do that, and they work in a gift shop for a couple hours a day, and the rest of the time they enjoy their summer there. And this couple had a spotting scope trained on a mountainside a ways away, and they were happy to let our kids take turns looking. And there were two grizzly bears feasting on an elk carcass up there on the mountainside. We got a close-up look without being in any danger. I found this picture of the old, the, the old car there with some bears. I don't know if they like the, the heat over the radiator. You can see a little snow on the ground. So I don't know, maybe they were enjoying that. Maybe they were just curious. But uh, this is a picture I took. Now in the center, about the center of the picture there, where the two logs come together, is a, is a beaver. It's a wonder there aren't any beavers left because beavers were the reason that people came out there. Explorers came out there. They wanted to find beavers. Um, buy beaver skins from the Indians or somebody else who would trap them and take them, ship them off to Europe where they were made into beaver hats. But the beavers are doing fine out there now. There's one there. He's got a wealth of logs to chew up and drag down to the, to the river to make his beaver lodge there. This is a picture very, I took it at twilight. You can just see the animal there at the bottom center of the screen. I told a ranger about that. And he said, that was a rare shot, rarer than a grizzly bear. It was a wolf of a certain kind that used to inhabit the park and uh, had been gone for many, many years, and they reintroduced it from another area. They had about three dozen of them. Very, very rare to see them, I guess. I don't know, it looks like a coyote to me. Tourism, of course, is something that one of the reasons for the park and one of the things that pays for the park, you can see when they built this entrance on the north, the Gardner entrance there by Mammoth Hot Springs, it says for the benefit and the enjoyment of the people. That's one of the major reason reasons for, for the park is to preserve it. So private investors couldn't come in, buy it up, sell off condominiums and keep other people out of there. It's there so that anybody can come through that gate and enjoy the wonderful sights in there. Of course, that began shortly that that Langford expedition was only seven years after the end of the Civil War. 
Shortly after that, when a Confederate soldier named Kelly, they call him Yellowstone Kelly, went up there and became a celebrated scout. There were others up there. And tourism began. As I said, there were 30, about three dozen tourists in the, in the park when Chief Joseph came through in 1877. But in the early days, if you were going to explore the park, you had to hire an outfitting company, somebody with pack animals and tents and all these things. So it was pretty limited to the people who could afford such a thing. But that would have been a lot of fun to enjoy that when somebody else did all the work. And they started building roads, of course. Roads for the horses, roads for the carriages. How do you like that? Building a road around a cliff there. <laughs> they... <laughs> There are several pictures of them moving rocks and they replaced it. Now it's a little more substantial in that same spot there. But here's one of the stagecoaches that would they would uh, take tourists around the park. Wouldn't that be just beautiful scenery? Look at the rugged rocks and and uh, looking way down the, over the cliffs at the water. Here's an even bigger stagecoach with a, with a six-horse pull to it. A beautiful day in Yellowstone Park, riding on top of that, you know, no truck motors humming, no noise, just the rustle of the horses and the neighing and, and you know, all that, and out there enjoying the wonders of Yellowstone. But in 1904, something happened. It was already happening to the rest of the world. The first automobile arrived at Yellowstone National Park, and the horses had to move over because the automobile eventually took over. I thought this picture was funny. We see RVs pulling pulling small cars. There's a guy with his covered wagon pulling a small car in the park there. I don't know what was going on. I guess uh, I guess it was the same thing. He was going to park his trailer and use the car to run around. But uh, of course the roads, a horse might get through that, but not a car. So they had to spend some time and attention and money and getting ready for all these tourists to uh, safely go through the park and they built roads there is one of the most uh, today there are hundreds of these vehicles going through every day that's an rv You're an early rv there the rangers thought it was so interesting they had to come out and have their picture taken in front of it and this gentleman has an even nicer you know if the engine wasn't too loud on this that would be a beautiful way to enjoy the park there if you get your wife to ride in one of those contraptions and, uh, you know, with the automobile came more tourists and more tourists. And so they built these big barns and hotels. This is one at Yellowstone Lake, one of the spots people like to go to. Here's one at Mammoth Hot Springs. Neither of those are there. There's a different one at Yellowstone Lake. Um, this is what they look like inside. Imagine trying to heat those things in the cool of the spring or the fall or especially in the winter. This is the complex, that's Old Faithful there, and you can see the lodge over there in the upper right, and there's that big circle the tourists can stand on. Well, they built that lodge there. There it is. It was built in 1904. I thought maybe that was a WPA thing in the 30s, the CCC boys, but it's not. It was built in 1904, that big barn there, and they have a four-sided fireplace that goes straight up and uh, has a you know, if I, opening on each side. You can see the stairs in the back. This is all open all the way to the roof, but that stairway goes up there, and they have a cup cupola up there. They used to call them widow's walks, and uh, they don't let people climb up there anymore. They spoil all the fun. Anyway, with the, with the houses, the housing, of course, came places to eat. Here was one, a, a stop midway between um, probably Old Faithful and, and the Yellowstone Lake was Larry's Diner. Larry was quite a character, I guess. There he is there. They tell stories about Larry. So one day, one day some, some European royalty came through and didn't think he got proper service, so he reminded Larry that he was a count. And Larry is reputed to have said, well, around here you only count as one, he said. <laughs> anyway, Larry's gone but they have plenty of places to eat. John Stoddard took this picture up there at Yellowstone Lake. He said he watched these men for an hour and a half and they caught all those fishes within an hour and a half. Boy, isn't that a dream? Good sized ones too. And of course there, John Stoddard saw the, saw the same thing happen there with that spot where you could catch a trout and put it in there and boil it for your dinner. A wonder of all wonders a boat up there, a steamboat up on Yellowstone Lake.
You can sail a steamboat up the Mississippi and up the Missouri and even up the Yellowstone, but how are you going to get one up 7,500 feet up in the air on top of what essentially is the bottom of a mountain? That's the Zilla. Many years it was there. Well, of course, they, they took it apart and carried it up there in pieces and put it back together. It finally burned, and you can still, if the water gets low, you can still find the bones of the Zilla in a certain spot there. This is a Wiley campground. Um, when uh, Henry Ford put America on the road and got it so everybody, even the newspaper boys, could afford to have a Model T, of course, they had to build up campgrounds. This Wiley campground was very, very, uh, you could see it with all its striped buildings there. But I like this picture. This is just one of those tent campgrounds that uh, you just find a spot and camp there. And there are children in the picture. I don't know if you noticed, but we haven't been seeing children in the picture because people that have children normally are still in that stage of life. They can't afford to go on big expeditions. But with the coming of the Model T, just next door Joe could load up his family and a tent and go out and see Yellowstone just like the rich folks used to be the only ones that could do. I think that's great there. Those uh, tourists aren't the only ones. Here's a presidential party of Chester Arthur. He was president back in the 1880s, not long after the park was organized there. And here's President Roosevelt. He loved the outdoors. He came out there and gave some speeches. I think they were opening up the north gate of Yellowstone. He dedicated it. Here's President Harding. He, uh, he didn't live long in, in office. He might not have lived that long if he'd have fed too many of these bears like that. But the bears used to be sort of tame. They knew that people meant food and garbage. Here's President Coolidge and his wife there in the dark suit in the middle. And I know that one bear is pretty big there. I'm not sure those Secret Service men could hold off that bear if he decided to eat the president. But anyway, and here's President Hoover before he was, he was Secretary of Interior. That big flood in Mississippi in 1927 kind of rocketed him to, to uh, fame and got him elected in 1828. He served one term. This is before that. He had to go out there and get some of that fishing in at Yellowstone National Park. This, is, this picture is interesting because it shows the other reason that Yellowstone was made a park. The first reason was to keep it open for the benefit of people who could come by and see it. The other thing was to protect the park from the people who came out to see it. As you can see in John L. Stoddard's day, there, weren't, there were no fences. People could go right up and sit on things. Remember those the pulpit terraces I mentioned earlier? I love these old colorized photos. You could go right up and stand in one of those things if you didn't mind getting your britches wet. And, uh, and of course, you know, a lot of those things were delicate. and People would break off chunks of them to take home. And you couldn't let that go on very long. They finally built a whole series of walkways and told people to stay on the walkways. I think that's even a camera to make sure they're doing it there. But uh, so you can't climb, climb up on things anymore. But I think the Park Service has done a really good job of making it so you get these beautiful views relatively close up of uh, all these things without endangering people. This is a, this is a, a newspaper editorial cartoon back then that talked about how Yellowstone Park was becoming commercialized and it needed to be saved from that before it got like this with the poor tourist arriving on the scene and being accosted by a whole bunch of people saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. Um, but uh, there was a serious side to these boardwalks too. When you got out on these flat bait, uh, geyser basins, you didn't know how thick the ground was. So the park service put the boardwalk out there so not only to keep you on the boardwalk, but so that you didn't step any wrong places. Um, there were stories about that. This book was in, the, was in the gift shop. I found one of them later. It was called Death in Yellowstone. All the ways that people have gotten themselves killed in Yellowstone National Park. There was one man that jumped into one of those, one of those boiling 
springs to save his dog. Of course, he only lived for a couple of hours. There was another series of pictures of a lady who was took a picture of a bear afar off, and then the next picture of the bear was closer, and the next picture of the bear was really close, and there wasn't any next picture because the bear ate her. I don't know if anybody bought those books, but I think they, they kept them there for sure, just to remind people to pay attention to what they were doing, and don't step off those boardwalks or you might plunge through some, some crust and be boiled um, into nothing. Anyway, that's the con I just had to come back to that picture because I love Hudson River School of Art Painters, and I think that's just a beautiful, a beautiful painting. Anyway, um, that's our program for today. Hope you enjoyed it. There's that picture in the background of those buffalo roaming. And the skies are not cloudy all this day. If you ever get a chance to go to Yellowstone, of course, take it. Uh, a lot of people have been there, and a lot of people have enjoyed it. There's many places I'd I'd uh, go back to Yellowstone the second time before I went someplace else the first time. Such an amazing, amazing place, and uh, well worth the visit. But that will have to be our program today. Don't forget to uh, don't forget to write some comment in the uh, in the space below on YouTube, and let me know what you think. Any improvements you'd like to see? Any subjects you'd like to see dealt with in the future? But uh, in the meantime, um, we'll see you again. Look for more programs in the future.